how can you test a rack application? This is a question that unfortunately, not a lot of people are trying to answer right now. They built this huge system that's supposed to trust the results of an LLM and they have no clue, they have no idea how they should structure that system so they can actually test, they can actually evaluate the system to ensure the results are good results. So that's the question that I want to answer today. I'm going to show you the code of a simple rack system, and I'm going to show you one way you can think and you can implement to evaluate that system. One way you can incorporate or create test cases that you can use to test your system continuously. Even better, I'm going to show you a way that you can use to evaluate different models doing the same work. So imagine you built this rack application. I want you to have an automated, um, an automated way to test whether GPT-4 is better than an open source model and do that systematically. Do that in a way it does not involve you trying different things because so far, what I've seen is that most people, they just do the entire integration. They have a couple of pet examples. They try those examples and that's it. That's the extent of testing this model. So hopefully by the end of this video, you have a better approach to this. By the end of this video, you're going to have the tools, all of them open source, that you can use to actually implement robust testing for your Rack application. Now, before I keep going, if you like this type of content, uh, just give me a like below. That's that tells the algorithm that I should keep doing this type of video. So if you enjoy it's free, just, just, just like the video. And uh, let me show you what I have here. All of the code that I'm showing you here it's going to be linked down below. So you can you can follow through with this. You can just install it on your computer and you can use it. Uh, this is a notebook. I'm gonna do everything on a notebook. It's a very simple notebook. And the first thing that you see here in the first cell is uh, just loading the environment variables into the notebook so I, I have access to them. And I'm just creating this OpenAI API key and I'm reading it from an environment variable. I created this environment variable before off camera, so I have it here set. That obviously is your OpenAI API key. Uh, that comes from my .env file that I created, and I'm not gonna show you because my key is there obviously, but you are going to need to set that environment variable. I'm gonna be using here Gizcard, which is an open source library that's gonna help me evaluate my Rack application, and Gizcard uses that OpenAI API key environment variable to do its job, okay? So make sure you do this. Particularly for my Rack application, I'm going to be using GPT-3.5 uh, because it's cheaper. You can actually change this to an open source model if you want to, or you can just use GPT-4, it doesn't really matter. So that is what this variable is for. It's for me later on when I create my model, I'm gonna be using this variable to uh, use GPT 3.5. All right, so let's start uh, in, in the, you know, in, in what really matters. And my Rack application is going to answer questions from a website, or actually it's gonna answer any questions and it's gonna answer those questions using the information from a website. So I teach this class, uh, it's called Building Machine Learning Systems That Don't Suck, and I have a website. And there is a ton of information on this website, okay? There are testimonials, uh, there is just information about the program, uh, different characteristics, like how many hours it takes to finish the program, how many assignments, there is a bunch of information here. Um, who is this program for, the stuff that you will learn. Uh, there is a syllabus, uh, like you can go here and you can see just, again, it's just ton of information. Uh, how much the program costs. Here is the syllabus of the program. And, you know, again, it's just a ton of information about the program. So what I want to do is build a rack system by 
uh, scraping this website. So I'm gonna gather all of the information on this website and I'm gonna store that information and then I'm gonna answer any questions from the user using this content. So that's sort of like the setup for, for this app. So to scrape the website, I'm gonna be using, oh, by the way, by, I'm gonna build my Rack application using Langchain. Um, you don't have to use Langchain. You can do like Llama Index if you wanted to. It's fine, I'm gonna use Langchain. That's the one that I prefer. So for Langchain, in this cell right here, this is how easy it is to do it with Langchain. I can scrape the website. So here is the URL of my website. It's dot, 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 ML dot school. And then here is what's happening here. I'm importing a couple of libraries. I'm creating a text splitter. And this splitter is just a class that's going to tell Langchain how I want to split the content that I'm scraping off of the website. So it's a ton of content. So let's say I'm going to scrape, I don't know, 10 pages of content. This splitter is a recursive character text splitter. It's telling Langchain that I want chunks that are no longer than a thousand characters. And I want an overlap of 20 characters between them. So what's going to happen is that the splitter is gonna go through all of the content it's gonna grab the first thousand characters. So those first 1000 characters, those are going to become one chunk. And then it's gonna go to the second 1000 characters with 20 characters overlap. So it's gonna take the last 20 characters from the first document and it's gonna start there. And then it's gonna grab another thousand characters and it's gonna keep doing that on and on and on. Now, why do I need to split all of the content? because my rack system uh, requires sending context to the model. So I'm gonna be telling the model, hey, answer this user question using the following context. And I want to include some context. Now, I do not want to send the entire website as the context because I'm probably gonna be violating the context size, right? There is a limited number of characters that I can send. So by splitting all of my website into smaller chunks, now I have a way to only send a few of these chunks at a time to answer any question. Uh, so that's pretty important whenever you're using a model that's sort of like a, has a constraint on how much context you have to send. Now, I recorded a video, it's on my channel, that goes into a lot of details about how the context size works and how all of these models treat the context size and, and the splitting and, and recursive character text splitter, all of that good stuff. Uh, it's gonna be linked somewhere here. If not, you can find it on my channel uh, if you want more information. Okay, so I'm defining my splitter and now I'm gonna use a web-based loader. And a web-based loader is just a class that behind the scenes uses beautiful soup to go to that URL and scrape all of the content from that URL. It's very simple. As you can see, I'm just uh, setting up the loader right here, giving it the URL. And then I'm gonna call the, the function load and split. And I'm gonna pass the text splitter that I just created so the function know or the loader knows exactly how I want to split that uh, content. And then I'm gonna just print out all of the documents that I'm gonna get out of that page, out of my website. And as you can see here, all of the documents that I get. And we're not gonna go through all the details, but uh, you can see building machine learning systems, the done suck, that's how the first document starts. And if I go all the way to the end, I don't know if it's gonna print it out here, we'll see. But if I go all the way to the end, it ends on, we'll use this time to, that's the final uh, sentence here. Let's look at the second document now. If I go to the second das document, we'll use this, this time to discuss the first principles behind building. See how there is an overlap there? That's what's happening here. That's because of my text splitter is asking to have a 20 character overlap. So this is awesome, this is working. Now I have a list of, I don't know how many, let me try here, length documents. Let's see, I have 10 different documents. From my website, I got 10 different documents. 
which is awesome. What we need to do right now is load all of those documents into a database. And that database is going to help us find the individual documents that are the most relevant to answer any question. And I already talked about this again on that video, but this database is going to be a vector store. And for this particular example, I'm just going to be using a vector store that, that in memory. Uh, in my other video, I also use Pinecone, which is an actual vector store. But here, this is fine. Just in memory, I'm going to be storing all of these documents. Now, there is something very important about a vector store database. And it's that when I store the documents, I'm also going to be uh, generating embeddings for each one of those documents. So what is an embedding? And I'm not going to go too deep into this, but an embedding is basically like an identifier for the document. It's a semantic identifier. So it's like a coordinates in space. And depending on what the document talks about, we're going to generate different coordinates for them. So imagine that if we talk about cars, the document is talks about cars and automobiles, well, the location is going to be over here. But if we talk about boats, uh, maybe the location, the embedding is going to point over here. So anything related to cars is going to go this way. Anything related to boats is going to go this way. And the reason this is important is because later on, we can find, uh, if we want uh, to answer a question about cars, about an Audi or about a Tesla, well, we can find documents on this section here, right? On the, in the location where all of the automobile documents are stored. That's what embeddings are gonna give us, right? So in order to create this or load this data into a vector store, we need to specify a class that's going to take care of generating those embeddings, those locations in space, right? And in this case, I'm using the OpenAI Embeddings class. Uh, you can see it here. So whenever I create this doc array in memory search, again, this is just a vector store that's storing everything in memory, just to keep it simple here. I say, hey, create this database from a list of documents that I have, right? So this is my list of documents. It's right here and use this OpenAI embeddings class to generate the embeddings that you need to store those documents. That's what's happening on this line. So after I run this line, I'm going to have my database, all of my documents inside, and for each one of those documents, I'm going to have embeddings generated for them. Okay, so that's great. So that means that if I have a query, I can find all of the documents that are similar to that query. So if I'm asking about BMW, how fast can they go? The documents that I'm going to return from the database are all related to cars and BMWs and Audis and that type of stuff. After doing this, I have my vector store. I'm going to create a knowledge base, okay? And this is key here and we start entering in the area of how do I test my system, okay? So I have all of these documents. I'm gonna be building a system. I'm gonna be building a rack application that is going to answer questions using these documents. How do I test that? And the steps that we're gonna go through here will make sense in a second, is we're gonna generate automatically a bunch of test cases. Now you can do that manually, but that's a lot of work. Here is what happens. If you're trying to test a classification system, something that classifies, let's say, patients into sick or healthy, right? A classification system is pretty simple to test because you can, you know the ground truth, you know whether a patient is sick or not, and you look at the response from the system, and if, this, if the response matches the ground truth, the system got it correctly, if not, it's it's wrong. That's it. It's just comparing the output with the with the correct label. The problem of a rack system when you're using a rack system for text generation is that it's it's really subjective. It's really hard to compare. Like if I ask you, hey, here you have, I don't know, here you have like a a document, and I want my rack system to to summarize that document, for example, I want a summarization of this page here. Like, how do you know if that summary 
truly reflects what the page says, right? It's 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 less clear how you can test these systems. So that's the challenge that we have here. So to start with, we need to generate a bunch of test cases. Like how do we test these? Well, let's just generate a number of test cases. And before we generate the test cases, I'm gonna create what we call a knowledge base, okay? So the knowledge base, it's just going to contain all of the documents that we have. That's that's the knowledge that we have. All of the documents that I just stored in the database. Now, in order for me to create that knowledge base, I need a data frame. It's a pandas data frame. Just a table structure where I'm going to organize all of those documents. Uh, so you can see here, I'm just creating that data frame off of the documents that we just loaded into the vector store. So nothing fancy here. I'm, I'm, I'm putting them in a column called text, because that's the input that I'm going to need to create my, my knowledge base. I'm printing out the 10 documents that I have, and those are go from zero to nine, and you can see that's the content. The content is, is just right there in that column. So this is awesome. Here is where we start, right? I'm gonna be using Giscard, which is a library that's gonna help me evaluate my rack system. Giscard has a class that's called knowledge base that's going to wrap all of these documents, okay? And the reason Giscar needs this, this knowledge base is because Giscar is going to help me generate automatic test cases. I want to see them in just a second. All right, so I'm going to wrap all of my data frame into this knowledge base class, okay? So after doing this, I have my knowledge base, and I'm going to use that knowledge base to do everything else from here on out. All right, so let's generate test cases. This is key, by the way. If you wanted to create your own test cases, you can do that. What is a test case? Well, the test case is gonna say, it's gonna be a question, a sample question. It's gonna, it's gonna have like what the answer should look like. And it's going to contain what is the document where the system should find that answer, okay? So if I ask you, hey, what is the price of the class? The sample answer should say, well, the class costs $450 and it should come together with the document, let's say document seven, where the price uh, is specified, right? We can do that manually, that would be a ton of work, okay? Generating sample test cases is a ton of work as you might imagine. So what Giscard is going to do for us, behind the scenes, Giscard is going to use that open AI environment variable that I told you at the beginning it was important to set, and it's gonna to connect to GPT-4, and it's gonna use GPT-4 with obviously specific prompts that they use to automatically generate test cases for my knowledge base. So here is how that looks like in code. I'm using the generate test set function from Giscard. I'm gonna pass the knowledge base, hey, all of the content that I know right now that we have, that we're using to power our rack system, that's the knowledge base. I'm gonna specify how many test cases do I want? 60 in this case, that's number of questions. I want to automatically generate 60 test cases. So just go at it. If you want 100, just set 100, 120, doesn't matter. You can generate many, many test cases. The longer your knowledge base is, the more content you have, obviously the more test cases you can generate, right? And then I'm gonna specify a description for this agent. That's going to help in the generation of test cases. Okay, so I'm just gonna specify a description for it. After I generate my test cases, after I run this, and this is gonna take a minute to finish. Remember, this is connecting to GPT-4 using your API key. You have to be, you have to understand that. It's gonna be using your API key to connect to GPT-4 to generate all of these test cases, okay? So after doing this, I'm printing out here just so you see them, and we're gonna open the file now. I'm saving also this to a file, but just so you see them here in the notebook, I'm printing out three of these questions, three of these test cases. And as you can see, I'm printing out the question number with what the question is. So the first question was, what does the machine learning system course offer? That was the first automatically generated question, okay? 
Then I'm printing out the reference answer, what GPT-4 thinks a good answer will be. So the machine learning system course offers 18 hours of live interactive session. It is a practical hands-on, yada, yada, yada. And I'm also printing out the reference context. In other words, what is the document or which documents answer this question, okay? And for this particular one is document zero. So the first document should answer this particular question. Now look at the second question here. Who is the instructor of the machine learning program? That is a test case that GPT-4 came up with. Giscard asked GPT-4 to come up with these questions and that was one of the test cases that I can use to test my system. Reference answer. The instructor of the program is Santiago, that's me. Reference context. Where is this answer coming from? And it says, well, there are two documents that can be used to answer this question, document five and document nine, okay? And then it goes on and on and on. Here in this cell, I'm just saving the test set to a JSON uh, file, JSONL file. So let's open that test set here and you can see all of the questions that were generated automatically by Giscard. So this is great. These are my test cases. Now I can use this to test my system, okay? So this is just this, is a very valuable step that we don't have to go through manually, which takes a ton of time and you think about it. Let's see, uh, let me see, question. Look at this, hello, I'm considering enrolling in the machine learning school program. This is simulating a user asking my system a question, which is great. That's exactly the type of test case that I need. So you get the question, you get the reference answer, right? What, what the correct answer should be. And you get the context at some point. There we go. You get the context. Again, it's just a, the list of documents containing that answer or the list of documents that the system should use to answer that question. This is awesome. I have 60 test cases now. Next step is to run those test cases. Next step is to actually validate my system. But I need to build a system first because I don't have a system right now. Let's just prepare the prompt. Um, this is gonna be just my simple chain, my simple rack system that is gonna work like this. I'm gonna grab a question from the user, uh, hopefully find the context in my database, in my vector store, put them together and ask the model to answer that question. And if the model cannot answer that question, then we can say, I don't know. That's what my prompt is. This is a very simple prompt to build a rack system. By the way, if you really want to build a rack system for something serious, there are much better prompts that help the model answer better. This is a very, very simple one. I'm just creating a prompt template. This is a class from LangChain that's gonna allow me to parameterize a prompt. So you can see I have two variables here. I have the context variable and I have the question variable. And whenever I execute this prompt or I use this prompt as part of a bigger rack system, I'm gonna have to pass those two variables or values for those two variables, the context and the question. So I'm creating this prompt template from the text that I just put in here. And I'm printing out what the template will look like after I format it with the two variables. You can see I'm passing the variable context. Here is some context and I'm passing a variable question. Here is a question, okay? So this is what I get, answer the question based on the context below. If you can answer the question, reply, I don't know, context, here is some context. Question, here's a question. Okay, so that works, that's fine, that's cool. Let's now create the rack chain. Uh, of course, I'm not spending a ton of time. There is a ton of um, ideas and steps that we have to go through in order to come up with this rack system. I'm not gonna go through all of them right now because I'm assuming you only care about evaluating these rack systems. But again, the video that I linked before in my channel goes through all of that. Uh, all of those ideas in order for you to get here. So let me try to explain what's happening here in this rack chain. Um, first of all, I'm gonna be creating the model. And um, like I told you before, I'm using GPT 3.5 model. That's the model that's gonna be answering 
the questions from my knowledge base, okay? So I'm just initializing my model here with the chat OpenAI class from LandChain. I'm passing the API key and I'm passing the name of the model, which is GPT 3.5 Turbo. I could be using GPT-4 here as well. If I wanted to, that will actually be a very interesting test because right now what's going to happen at the end of this is that I'm going to have GPT-3.5 answering questions and those questions will be evaluated by GPT-4 because GPT-4 was the one generating the test cases in the first place. So that's just, just the way it, it happens here. All right, so I'm going to create my chain, okay? And a chain... Is what the name says. It's just a, a, like a string of components where the input or the output of one component will become the input of the next component in that chain. So that's how you build here in Lang chain, and that's one of the reasons I like it a lot. I'm going to start with the first component here in my chain, and it's this map that you see or dictionary that you see. And notice that there are two keys on this dictionary. The first key is context, and the second key is question. And the reason I have this map here is because the second component is the prompt that we created. Let me scroll up to that prompt. Remember, that prompt requires two variables. So the input to that prompt is two variables, context and question, or is it's a map with two variables inside. Because of that, the first component of this chain is a map that again is going to get fed into the prompt, which is the second component. Now let's see where these values are coming from. The first value is the context. Where is the context coming from? Well, obviously it has to come from my vector store. My vector store contains all of the documents that are stored right there. And some of those documents are going to be the context that I need to send to the model to answer a particular question. How do we know which documents? Well, we need to pass to the vector store. We need to pass a question and tell the vector store, give me any questions that are similar or give me any documents that are similar to this question. Remember how embeddings work. If I tell the vector store, give me what the price of the course is, the vector store should look through all of those embeddings in space and return any embeddings that are around the location that talks about prices and costs, right? So if that such location exists, any documents that are very similar to that center point are going to get re uh, returned back to me. And hopefully the, those documents will answer the question that I ask, which is, how much does it cost? The way I, I, I do that, or, or, or I sort of like accomplish that here in code, is by taking the vector store that we created and generating a retriever from that vector store. That retriever, uh, let's do this, let's do this, so, so maybe, maybe this is going to make it a little bit clearer. Okay, so I'm going to create a retriever, and I'm going to say, hey, just the vector store, just uh, give me a retriever, okay? And let's see what we can do with that retriever, okay? So if if you do, you probably know this, but if you use the function there, this is gonna return all of the functionality of that retriever. Okay, so look at this, what do we get here? These are all of the functions that we can call from that retriever here. That's a bunch of stuff. So let's see the gets, uh, get prompts, get relevant documents. Okay, so that sounds like a, that sounds cool. Uh, there is invoke as well. Okay, so let's do the get relevant documents. Let's try this out. Let's do, let's comment this out here. And let's do retriever, get relevant documents. Uh, look at this. So what is the machine learning school? Okay, top K1, I don't, I'm don't. i not gonna pass that. Let's see what happens when I do this. Did that even work? Let's go up. Oh, this is awesome. Okay, so when I call get relevant documents on a retriever and I pass a string, what's going to happen is exactly what you're imagining right now. The retriever will return the top four documents in this case, the top four documents that are related to that question 
the top four of them are going to come back. And that is exactly what we need to accomplish here as part of the long chain chain. In this case, we are using the us retriever here, but we could be using just a retriever. It doesn't matter, just the retriever variable that we use here. And we are passing the question. And this item getter, I'm going to let uh, you figure that out, but the item getter is just a function from the operator package. And the item getter is just basically going to grab the question out of the function that you apply this to. So in other words, or in English, uh, what's going to happen is that I'm going to, when I invoke that chain, I'm going to be invoking that chain. You can see it here. I'm going to be invoking that chain with a variable called question, right? Or with an attribute. It's going to, I'm going to pass a dictionary with an attribute inside that's called question. This item getter is going to grab the value of that question and it's going to pass the value of that question to the vector store retriever that we created right here okay just to make it clear let's just do retriever if i can spell retriever here okay so it's going to pass that question to the retriever and we already know that what's going to, what this is going to do is return the relevant documents that is what's going to happen so now the context the context here will have a map or a list of relevant documents. So this same list that you see here, that is the list that we are going to be passing to that context variable. Okay. The second one is pretty straightforward. I'm saying I also need to an attribute called question. Let's just put the same value that we invoked this chain with. Okay. So the same value of question here is going to just go here. And that is my first component of the chain. Unfortunately, the most complicated one to understand because everything else is going to be pretty simple. The next component of the chain is a prompt, which is just the prompt that we defined before. We're going to be injecting the context and the question to that prompt. The output of that prompt, which is a well-formatted prompt, is going to go into our model. So now we're going to be invoking our model, our GPT 3.5. It always takes me a second to say GPT 3.5 always takes me a second to think about that. So we're going to take that prompt, invoke the model with that prompt. The model is going to return an answer back. Now, in this particular case, I'm not going to get into too many details, but in this particular case, that model, actually, we can, we can, uh, we can look at here in action. I'm going to add another line. I'm going to say model.invoke. Let's just invoke the model uh, with tell me, tell me a joke. Okay, I'm going to invoke that model. With, oh, actually, I cannot do that here. I'm going to do it here. Oh, of course not, because I have not executed this. Okay, so that's that's awesome. Let's, let, me just exec, let me just execute this. And let me say, model, tell me a joke. And in this case, notice that, yeah, I'm getting a joke back from GPT... 3.5. This is my joke. It's a bad joke, obviously. Notice that this is not like clean string text. It comes like wrapped into an AI message. And the reason is because this is a chat model. So it's supposed to have system message and human message. And in this case, this is an AI message. So it's a message coming from AI. I don't want that. I want clean strings, clean strings. So I'm going to be passing a parser, which is just a string output parser which is going to make this go away. So the output of a chain is actually going to be a string. All right. So let me remove this. That explains why you see prompt, then model, then string output parser, just to clean that class out and get clean, beautiful strings. And then here is just the test of the tests where I invoke my chain just to make sure it works. I'm saying, okay, invoke my chain and pass a question, I need to pass a question, what is the machine learning school? And look at the answer, it's beautiful. The answer is just a string. Just to make sure I did not lie, I need you to trust me. When I invoke this chain without the parser, look what's gonna happen. See, AI message, horrible. We don't want that. So let me re-execute this. Beautiful, just string, clean, that is what we need. All right. We have our knowledge base. We created test cases. We have a chain. We have a rack system. 
We need to test that rack system. How good is the rack system? That is what's going to happen right now. To do this evaluation, we're still gonna use Giscard because Giscard is gonna take care of running every single test case through my chain, take an answer, evaluate that answer. Is it a good answer or not? That is what the tricky part is. Remember, this is not a classification model. You cannot just compare strings and say, yeah, this string is exactly like this string. You have to use a model to look at two answers and say, yeah, I think they're hitting the same points. I think both of those answers are answering the same question. That is what Giscard is going to do behind the scenes. So how do I use this? Well, they have a function that's called evaluate. Very simple, okay? So that function requires a test set, which we already have, we created it, they require the knowledge base, which is the original data. Where is the data coming from? And it requires a function that is going to call the model. Okay, so in this case, I'm calling it answer function. You can call it however you want. This function is very simple. It's going to receive a question and an optional history if you want to enable history for your chat application. In this case, I'm not enabling it just so I keep this simple. And then I'm going internally within that question. The goal of that question is to answer that question or the goal of that function, sorry, is just to answer that question. What I'm doing here is just invoking the chain. So I'm going to be invoking the chain, passing that question. And what's going to happen is that within this evaluate function, Giscard is going to repeatedly call my function passing the different questions that it needs to evaluate, okay? So that's pretty cool. You call this evaluate function and it's gonna give me back a report. And when you run this, it's gonna take a second to run. And remember, this is going to be using GPT-4 behind the scenes. So I imagine without looking at the source code, I imagine that what's happening is it's going through all of the test cases, grabbing the first test case, sending it, sending that question to my chain, my rack system, grabbing the answer, and then using GPT-4 to compare the answer from my chain with the reference answer that we generated before. It's gonna compare those two. And if they are similar, if they look correct, it's gonna give me a point. And if they don't, I don't get any points. And at the end, we can determine how accurate my system is. How many questions did I get correctly? It should do that behind the scenes. So what is in that report? We can just display the report if you're working on a notebook. Uh, you can just display the report and see what it looks like. If not, you can also open a web page. So I'm displaying the report here, but I'm going to go to the web page because it looks a little bit better. Uh, I opened the report after running it later. And here's what you get. First, there is a UMAP representation of my knowledge base. And that's, again, the more questions I have, the, the larger my knowledge base is, the more interesting stuff you're going to get here. Here you get where the false uh, answers are or the incorrect answers are, where they're located. If my knowledge base was, was bigger, well, obviously this will tell me, this will give me more information about what areas of my knowledge base are not well covered or I'm having problems. Remember, I only have 10 documents here, okay? So that's why you have so few points. Uh, you get a component analysis here. We're gonna see that in a second. We're gonna talk about that in a second. But this is giving me a score for every single component of my rack system. We're gonna talk about through all of them in a second. There are some recommendations, some correctness by topic. I have only one topic in my website. This can get really, really complex with larger knowledge base. And the overall correctness score is 73.33%, okay? That's my overall how good my system was right now. Okay, so let's talk about this component analysis. Let's go back here. So I can show you, uh, I have here sort of like a, the score, individual score for each one of the components of a rack system. So the first one is the generator. And if you scroll, like if you uh, put your mouse on top of it, you can see what is that component about. So in this case, this is the large language model that we used to uh, in the chain to generate the answers. So the way Giscard is evaluating my system is it, depending on what the test case looks like, is trying to evaluate 
all of these components separately. Now, in my simple chain, I don't have a uh, I don't have a rewriter and I don't have a, a routing. The rewriter will be a component that you had in your chain to rewrite the question. Like when the when the user asks something that doesn't look like correct, you could have a component that rewrites that question in a way that simple. It's easier to answer that question. It becomes more relevant. I don't have a rewriter here in this case. So obviously I'm not doing that great in those type of questions. In questions that should be rewritten, I'm not doing too hot here. Uh, the retriever is just getting the most relevant questions from my map. Uh, so I should work a little bit better on how, on those embeddings, on how that the similarity uh, gets computed and how I get the relevant documents. So this breakdown is great to tell you exactly what you should be focusing on. So let's go down a little bit. Here's my recommendation. I'm saving, or you can save that report to HTML. That's the HTML document that I show you. I You can also just sort of like print the correctness or compute the correctness based on question type, okay? That's what you get here. You see the complex questions, 90% uh, correct. Conversational questions, 50% correct. This makes sense. I did not include a history in my chat. Remember that uh, this supports, when I'm using a chat open AI model, uh, it supports a conversation. So it supports keeping context. I did not use that. So I'm sure that by using that, I can improve the conversational aspect of my rack system, which I did not implement. Distracting elements, only 50%. So questions that were generated with distracting elements here, they did not score well. So I'm gonna have to do better there. Double questions, simple questions, situational questions, what 100%. So this is gold because this tell me how my system is doing and where should I focus on to fix my system. By the way, there are no topics here, but Gizcar has the ability to ge automatically generate topics based on your documents. So if I had like a bigger document or a bigger knowledge base, Gizcar were it's able to just generate different topics, recognize and generate different topics, and then give you scores on those topics. So you know, okay, so anything related to price, the LLM is doing great. Anything related to this other topic is not doing great. Okay, so I can also get the failures. So if you want to know exactly what questions did this system fail, so I can get the list of failures, I can save this, I can do whatever I want. So let me see a simple, well, you cannot read the whole question here because it's, it's what does the machine learning system course, blah, 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 reference answer, conversation. Look at this, look at this, conversation history. See how there is conversation for some of the questions? I'm not supporting that right now, so I'm not surprised the system is not doing great on those. Okay, so all of that is awesome. If you stop the video right now, you already have a ton of value here. Just by doing this, you have a ton of value, but there is more. There is more, okay? This is great to run an evaluation of your system one time. Just do it one time. How is it doing? Great. I want to actually automate this. I want to do this every time I push a change or every time I'm ready to make a deployment. Uh, I want to just run a test suite with all of my test cases. By the way, those test cases that were auto-generated, you can add your own as well, right? You can add your own test cases, you can fix them, you can do whatever you want with them. But the key here is I want to automate my tests. So how do we do that? Well, let's let's take a look. So here, it's I'm just loading the test set from the JSON-L file, just loading them in memory, very simple. And I can just create a test suite. It's just take the test sets, and generate a test suite, that's the name of the test suite that will be referenced later. Whenever you run multiple test suites, you know exactly which one it is. One line creates a test suite for me, and then I can run that test suite. So how do I do that? In order to run this test suite, I'm going to wrap my chain in a Giscar model, okay? So this is a class that's gonna provide all of the information to Giscar that it needs to run my tests. So look at this, a Giscar model requires a prediction function or the model that's gonna be answering the test suite or it's gonna be solving the test suite. And we're gonna see that in a second. What the type of model is, so in this case it's text generation. You can do classification. You can use this card to just do classification or that type of stuff. What is the name? What is the description? Always specify these two parameters. They help the model make decisions. 
And what is the feature name that I care about? In this case, it's going to be the question. Okay, so that's the feature that we care about. That's the question that we need to answer. Now, look at this prediction function. I call it batch prediction function. This is very similar to the answer function we created before to run that report, that evaluation report. But in this case, I'm just answering question in batches. So when running the test suite, this car is not going to go question by question. It will take a long time. So it's actually doing this in batches. And what's cool about LangChain is that I can run, I can invoke a chain with a batch of inputs. And that's exactly what's happening here. This is my chain. And now I'm passing a batch. So it's an array of questions. Same thing as invoke before, but now it's in batches. So we can send multiple questions to the model at the same time. We don't have to wait for one answer before sending the next question. That makes this really, really fast. So very similar as before, I receive a data frame. I go through that data frame, all of the values of questions, and I'm passing them as an array of a map with one attribute that's called question here. When I run this model, I can get now the test suite and I can say run past the Giscard model and my test suite is going to run. And look at this, it says that it succeeded with 62%. That's the metric that I'm getting back when I run this test suite. And that is awesome because now I can automate the process of running this test suite. By the way, I obviously I can just get from the results. I can just get, you know, what the metric was, was the result was I can get that information here to automate something like before deploying the model, make sure the test suite passed. If it didn't pass, then don't deploy the model. That will be the way to automate this. There's one more thing here. Uh, notice here I'm displaying the results of the test. You can see the test suite passed. The metric was 0.61667, which is a pass. That's the name of the test suite, all of that good stuff. The final thing that I have to show you is how do we integrate this with PyTest? Why PyTest? Because if you're not using PyTest, you are not doing it correctly, okay? So PyTest, in my opinion, is the best unit test library that there is for Python. So of course, I jumped all over this when I saw that you could actually integrate this with PyTest. In my example here, I'm using something that I don't see many people using because guess what? People who use notebooks, they're not thinking about testing their code. They should, but they're not. I'm using here the IPyTest library, which is a library that's going to allow me to run PyTest tests directly from my notebook. And it's great. So I'm going to install Py, IPyTest, IPyTest, not PyTest, but IPyTest. And then I can use a cell magic, as you can see here, percentage, percentage, IPyTest. And this cell became runnable. Like if I run this test, this cell is going to run all of the test cases inside, just like if I were running this with PyTest, which is awesome. So look at this code here. It's very simple. I have only one test. So I have a fixture here that returns a data set. And the data set is just me loading the test set from the hard drive, I'm loading my test sets, my 60 test sets, and I'm returning a data set. I'm turning that test set into a data set, and I'm returning that. Then I have a model fixture that is going to return the Giscard model that I had, that I created before. I can also create it here inside, but I just decided to just reference the one that's, that's outside. And then I have a single test case, okay? This single test case that receive both fixtures the data set and the model. And it's gonna use a function that's called test LLM correctness. There are a bunch of functions inside Giscard that you can use to test different aspects of a system. In this particular case, I just care about is the LLM correct? And I pass the model and I pass the data set. And very, very important, I pass a threshold. That threshold indicates how high should I need my results in order to declare that this was successful, okay? And in this particular case, the tests pass because my threshold is under 0.62%. So 62%, that's the metric that I'm getting. I'm not gonna run it here on screen because it takes a little bit of time to answer all of those 60 questions, but just trust me, when I run this, it's going to 
succeed. Now, if I set that threshold to 0.70 or 0.80, now these tests are going to fail. With this, you can see how you can integrate with your system if you're using PyTest. Now you can integrate unit tests for your LLM application. You can evaluate your LLM application automatically, not just by calling John Doe or Mary Black and telling them, can you try a few questions and see if it works, which is what I've been seeing. That is bad. With this, you can actually do it automatically. So hopefully this makes sense. Hopefully this helps you. If you got all the way to the end, just please like this video. It helps me understand whether this type of content is useful for you. And I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.